Great to be in the house of the Lord today, is it not? This is in my Bible. This is the one I wrote a couple of quotes on because I want to quote them accurately. Not mess them up. If you have your Bible today, turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We're looking through verses 1 through 12 this morning. Galatians chapter 1. I'm throwing some of you that are used to me reading out of the New American Standard. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. Why? Well, because I can. I see that the barricade is gone this morning. I'm on to you on this side. Or on this side. This side. Galatians chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ the God, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to be, deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in grace of, of Jesus Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who, are trouble, who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. If we have... I, as we have said before, so I say again, if anyone preaches to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Am I trying to please man? If I was trying to please man, would I not be a servant of Christ? For I will have you know, brothers, that the gospel which was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. I know, I forgot to fill up my cup this morning. We finished our sermon series in Mark, and here I come to this side of the stage. I'll drift over here eventually. We finished up our sermon series in Mark with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then, when you want to transition... One of the things you ask yourself is, what is the next step to go to? A lot of people like jumping into Acts. I, I think the best thing to go to is, is how do you live the resurrected life? How does one live a life of the believer? And Paul in Galatians writes, I think, probably the best primer for how one is to live a godly life in the fact that it begins addressing some of the very basic issues of the Christian walk. Why? Because in Galatians, Paul is going to address what is known as the Judaizer controversy. And this controversy is that faith plus works equals salvation equation. And this is very common and easy to fall into. And Galatians is one of those books that, that declares freedom from the work of the law. We'll discuss it. We have documents throughout our history. On the bulletin it says, Galatians, the Magna Carta of Christian Liberty. And the Magna Carta was when the English nobility had decided that the king's power had gotten too totalitarian. That they forced the king into resigning certain powers that he has. It was designed to prevent tyranny. We in America, we have a document that has this phrase in it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are born and are afforded certain inalienable we have a constitution and a bill of rights, and those documents are designed to free men from the tyranny of human oppression. We live in one of the freest nations in the world because of that document. In Galatians, we have basically the constitution or the Magna Carta of Christian living. We now, and what Paul is going to do is say, hey, this thing called works does not have a plus sign with faith. So you go, well, what about James? Well, James and Paul are not in antithesis with each other. They're actually incongruent. Paul and James would both say you have a faith, but you have a faith 
that must work. You have a faith that is a working faith. Just like when you look at an apple tree, you can tell that it is an apple tree by the fruit that it produces, correct? From a distance it's a tree, you look and the fruit is the apple tree. It is not an apple... Uh, falling out. So you have here in the book of Galatians this going on. But Paul, and very early on, is asserting something very interesting. Paul, in all the books that, uh, that he writes except for one, asserts his apostolic authority. And in the book of Galatians here, he asserts it in a very vehement way. And that's why many believe this is his first book that he writes. I believe that Paul writes the book of Galatians in 49 A.D. Why? Well, if you look in chapter 2, you see the Jerusalem Council. And a lot of folks like to align the Jerusalem Council. It could have happened between 47 and 48 A.D. with what is occurring in Galatians. So you have a lot of similar controversy going on at the same time. This would be called the Southern Galatian View. I'm not going to tell you the Northern Galatian View. If you want to find it out, go look it up for yourself. So this is the Southern Galatian View. Paul, just so you look at the text. Paul, an apostle. Not sent from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now what does it mean to be an apostle? Well, if you listen to people today, well, I'm an apostle because I claim the mantle of an apostle. Um, apostle with a capital A. One of the twelve, or Paul, who have seen an eyewitness or direct training from Jesus Christ. There are no more apostles with a capital A. Period. The last one died in 90. That was John. And so while you have people today wanting to assert apostolic authority, this is it's a little secret as to how pastors like to assert authority. Uh, apostolic authority that they do today is, well, you have pummeled me logically and theologically, but I am an apostle. And therefore, what I say is more important than what you say because you're just a pastor. See how that works? It's an appeal to authority argument. It almost always works that way. And, and, and it's cute and it's neat, but it's not biblical. Notice what Paul says about his apostolic authority. Because the Judaizers are going to say, hey, this Paul guy is a nice guy, but he is misleading you, and he's teaching you a false doctrine, and he's taking you away from the faith. And I better watch out because I'm going to step right off that stage. And he's going to continue to mislead you because he's got a doctrine of man. And Paul is going to make it quite clear where his authority comes from. The word apostle means sent one. It can also be understood as an ambassador. An ambassador in the ancient Near Eastern world, when he showed up, he didn't have to call Washington and say, hey, I'm about ready to make this deal. Is this okay? And he's kind of the go-between. But the real authorities are so an ambassador in the ancient Near Eastern world could make decisions on behalf of the empire because he represents the man that sends him. An ambassador from Rome would represent the emperor in all matters. And when he speaks, he's speaking for the emperor. He's not speaking as Joe Roman dude in the first century. When he speaks in authoritative manners for the Roman Empire, he speaks as the emperor. If you were to harm him, you have not harmed the ambassador. You have harmed the emperor of the Roman Empire, and such the armies will come towards you. See, it is not simply, well, I'm a guy who's come to talk because I like this message and I'm going to preach it. I am an ambassador not sent to the agency of men like the ambassadors of the day you see. Not like the chief priests... Not like the council that convicted Jesus Christ. Paul's authority, Paul's apostolic authority, comes from Jesus Christ. And basically what that means is when Paul speaks, when Paul's writing this book, Paul is speaking for Christ. Paul is assuming he is writing Scripture. The apostle at the movie theater, when he speaks, not writing Scripture. Big difference between the two. And so Paul authoritatively is speaking to this church, and you see it in the argumentation he uses. And so his authority that he asserts early on is not that it comes from men. But he is the direct mouthpiece of the Lord Jesus Christ, who the Father 
has raised from the dead. See the language that's being used here. I an apostle, not for men, not through men, but through Jesus Christ. And then also through God the Father. References to two of the members of the triune God. Who raised him from the dead. This is also something that a lot of folks have a hard time believing. But yet, Paul cites it here. Grace and peace to you, verse 3, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us out of this present evil age. Here in this greeting, you have some very decent, very good theology coming in here. Christ's death delivers us from this present evil age. When we look at the concept of faith and works and salvation, we have several ways of looking at it. For the longest time, the Catholic Church held that it was faith plus works equals salvation, and that works were essential. It was an essential aspect of the faith. And you say, well, those Catholics got it wrong. Here's the thing, folks. We as Baptists, we like our rules. We tend, and I grew up, a very independent fundamentalist, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't chew, you don't date girls that do, you don't play cards, you don't play games with dice in them, you don't, you don't. You. And the list of don'ts is longer than the list of do's. And what happens is, oh, well, you don't have, you know, these things don't affect your salvation, but if you do those things, well, you must not really be saved. See how they tuck it on one side of them? When you attach these rules to faith, you're doing exactly what the Judaizers are doing. Faith plus works, faith plus works, faith plus works. This is what the, Ju the Judaizers were basically saying. Hey, you have to abide by the dietary and the clothing law and all the laws of the Old Testament and faith to equal salvation. Paul is okay, he's a nice guy, but he's gotten it wrong. And the fact of the matter is, it's not faith plus the only works that save us, and Moses and Luther makes this point pointedly clear, and I wrote it down so I'm going to copy it over. The only works that justify us are the works of Christ by faith alone. It is by his works, not ours. Notice this is kind of the language that the text is talking about. You don't see anything about us doing in this introduction. It's about Christ and the Father's doing. It's the work of Christ that brings salvation by faith alone. It's his death on the cross. It's his resurrection. It's his burial. It's his calling. It's his action. Not that it's all him. We have a, we have a responsibility in this as well. When we look at the text, there's always this tension between what God knows and what we respond to. And this tension exists. And so the God is a prime example and a prime mover. And we have a response that we must have. And so while you have God doing the primary action, we are a secondary component, and it combines, and it makes faith and salvation. And so you have here that Christ died to deliver this out of this present evil age. Notice that it doesn't say that he gave himself for our sins to deliver us plus works out of this present evil age. When we have the topic like this, people get a little antsy because, well, some folks like to hold up to the dietary laws of the Old Testament, and they think that's great. And you know what? Here's the thing. If you have a personal conviction about holding to some of the Old Testament dietary laws and, and things like that, as long as it is your personal conviction, you're good. Go be blessed by God and have, have I, I personally would never adopt those, but okay, if you want to, go and be blessed by God. But when you say that every member must follow the dietary laws. You've crossed into faith plus works. See, that's what happens when we insist that everyone does these things. Because I have a preference towards them, we've entered into faith plus works. See, modern Christianity has experienced something kind of interesting. Um, Messianic Judaism used to be Jews who converted to Christianity who wanted to retain their Jewish essence and celebrate the feasts. And they carried that over into Christianity. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in faith 
alone. They believe in, in, in Christ's work alone, but they want to maintain their Jewish connection. They don't insist that we all adopt the Jewish connection. About the hmm, 40s or so, or sorry, the 60s or so, there began a, a new movement. And they called themselves Messianic Jews, and they're co-opting the name to give it legitimacy. And what this is, is it's individuals who are Christians, who now are adopting the Jewish lifestyle and the, and the, and the aspects of observing all the dietary feasts. And now, a lot of them hold that you must hold to those. The Christianity is perverted. Sounds similar to what Paul is talking about here in Galatians? Christianity has perverted the message of God and you must now hold to the dietary laws and all the feasts and all these things. That's faith plus works. It's faith plus works. And again, it's not that, that there are no such things as, as good works and there's no such things as the law. What Paul is not addressing here is in the technical term antinomianism, which basically means no law, which basically means I can do whatever I please. God has saved me and therefore I can live my life however I wish. What does Paul say? Where sin abides, grace abounds even more. So therefore, should I sin to where grace abounds all the more? And what does Paul say? May it never be. It's actually a little bit stronger in the Greek that way, but we'll hold it right there for a minute. May it never be. So it is Christ that delivers us out of this present evil age. It is Christ's death that delivers us out of this present evil age. If you remember your Sunday school lesson in the book of Hebrews... The law was maintained by men who by death separated them from continuing. Who every time they went to sacrifice had to purify themselves before they could purify the nation. But the second covenant, the first covenant being the one is two by men, the second covenant is completed one time in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now why do we like that? We like rules. I used to be a member of the giant, largest rule-generating entity in the world outside the IRS. Misformation. There's a new rule. I remember getting up at 4.30 in the morning to stand on the side of the road to take a run at 6.30 in the morning because someone was late one time. There are rules for how to wear your clothes. I'm so glad I don't have to do with that anymore. And, and, and I understand that. But here's the thing. We like rules. See, rules help us to define how good we are. Well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't chew, and I don't date girls that do. I'm better than you. Really? That's the argument the Pharisees had. That's the argument the Sadducees had. That's the argument that the Jews had in the New Testament. We follow the law. Ha, ha, ha. Yippee-ki-yay. <coughs> Drop down, verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Jesus Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I'm astonished. I am astonished. I am bewildered, befuddled, confused beyond all cognition, woefully amazed. For those of you who are parents, when you walk into the room and there's stuff on the floor and you look at the kids and they go, who did this? They go, I don't know. It had to be someone. It had to be someone else other than me. And mommy's still asleep. Let's get this cleaned up before we all feel that wrath. You see this when people will look you in the eye or just watch any political debate where one side has facts and the other side has emotions and you look at the emotional side and you look at you and go, that makes no sense. Well, it doesn't have to make sense. There's a motive. I am so bewildered why? Paul was just there. 
He was just there. He's left. I mean, it's like giving an order and walking away and coming back in, and you see people just sitting there doing nothing. You go, did you get it done? Uh Uh-huh. You look, and it's not done. I am amazed. I just... It blows my mind beyond comprehension that you are deserting. The word here, deserting, isn't a best translation. It's not simply that they just ran away, that they went AWOL. They actually pulled a bow bird doll. They dropped their gear. They ran out the gate. They joined the other side. They pick up the other side's weapons and begin shooting back at Jesus. That's what this means. It's not that you've run away. It's not that you've fled. You have left the side of Team Jesus and are now on the other side engaged in hostile activity back. Do you see the amazement? You have given up freedom to embrace slavery. We have all seen people make horrifically bad decisions and tried to help them and watched as their life and decision crumbled totally out of control when you watch with the utmost of amazement at them and go, (sighs) there's a video clip, guys, is worth watching. It's called It's Not About the Nail. YouTube it. It's hilarious because you see the difference in the way guys and girls try to fix things and the guy is trying to fix the problem. And he just needs to shut up. When we watch people make bad decisions and we try to fix, we get amazed at the bad decisions they make and helplessly watch out of control. Because here's what they're doing. They're fighting against the freedom that they have in Jesus Christ. And wanting to adopt something that imprisons them. This is why when legalism is so dangerous to the church. Because when, what happens is we forget about the text and start following the rules. And the rules supersede the text. You say, you don't believe me? Go to a church like that and break one of them. Watch how fast. Watch how fast. Because I come out of that tradition. Watch how fast you get drummed out. Quickly. I remember going to watch Star Trek. My dad said, don't say anything to church. We're going to go watch or the Star Wars back in 75. Don't say anything because we're not supposed to go to the movies. But it was cool. It was awesome. I still end up saying something and getting in trouble. Anyhow, but I'm amazed that you are joining the other side against him who called you in the grace of Christ. For a different gospel. It's not really a different gospel. It's not even a gospel at all. It's a lie. You see why this is so vital for how one lives the Christian life after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Why? Because it's so easy to go back to what we know and what is comfortable, which are rules. We are geared to our rules. Not that it is another one, but there are some who are troubling you and who want to distort the gospel of Christ. A lot of times, theologians get a bad rap because it sounds like we're arguing over minutia. And I've heard this, and it just really just grinds my grits, really does. It just, you'll find out there's a lot of things that grind my grits. Anyhow. Theology sometimes seems like it's trying to figure out how many angels will fit on the head of a pin. That sounds cute. That sounds really cute, especially from people that don't really understand the dangers of theology and the dangers of bad theology. See, you also hear it in this phrase, well, you know, doctrine divides. It does. It absolutely does. It divides heresy from truth, error from truth, divides... Faith plus works equals salvation, and faith alone equals salvation. See, the heretic loves to hide in nebulous language. Because he can define his argument with the nebulousness of the language. And we think 
he's saying the same thing as what we're saying, and so we let him in. Which is why it's so important that we parse what we say. The line between truth and error in Trinitarian theology is about the width of a piece of... I mean, it's very narrow. And there are things that you have taught kids, Trinitarian theology, that are not accurate. The fire analogy, the egg analogy, those are, those are heretical. Those are called modalism. They're bad. Very, very bad. Because here's the thing. You will never teach orthodoxy by teaching heresy. Ever. It's like teaching a kid how to shoot a weapon aiming down the barrel with the trigger at this end. So you'll do it once, and then you'll never do it again. You will never teach orthodoxy by teaching heresy. Arius did not wake up one morning and say, you know, today, today I will lead millions of Christians to hell with a heresy. Today. It begins by working in the nebulous language. It begins in the own personal study without being checked. And what Arius does is Arius teaches a very subtle understanding of the Trinity. He teaches that Jesus Christ is not fully deity. He might be divine, but he's not deity. And how this works out is Coptic Christians now hold to that, that Jesus is less than the Father. The Goths and Visigoths, they adopted Arian theology, and when they sacked Rome, they persecuted the Roman church, the Western church, because the Western church held the Trinitarian theology that the Son was God. And they persecuted the church vehemently. You rarely hear about this. But this is wrong. Because he was hiding in the nebulousness of the language. And so it's important that language is part. And Paul is going to do this in this book. He's going to lay this out uniquely. There are some that trouble and want to distort. Notice the distortion. You must follow the Old Testament laws. You must work and have faith for your salvation. Unless we look and say, well, those Catholics do that, but we don't. Folks, when we start tying things like drinking, smoking, and dating girls that do, games with cards, games with dice, going to movies, and we start elevating that up in what makes one believe, we're doing the same thing as everybody else is doing. Because it becomes faith plus works equals salvation. Now, don't hear me and say, Pastor said I could smoke and drink. That's not what I said. Don't you leave here and say, Pastor told me I can drink. No, do not, no, no, no. I will jump on you very hard for that. No, 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 I didn't say that. I'm saying when we equate those things to our salvation or the maintenance of our salvation or the obtaining of our salvation, we've stepped into that law. There are other verses that talk about the, 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 the cessation of drinking. There are other things that talk about how believers should live, but that is not what I'm saying. To tamper with the gospel is to trouble the church. The church's greatest troublers do not come from outside. They come from the inside. We'll go down a list of cults. We went through it in the, in the young adult class. Go down a list of cults. They were from the inside church. Jim Jones. The wacko up here at Waco. And go on down the list of cults that, I'm sorry, get a little sound effect going there. Going down the list of those who have troubled the church, the Arians, troubled the church greatly. Why? Because they preached that Christ was not divine. That he was not the God-man, Jesus Christ. He was less than. Get this in liberal theology that starts to talk about the value of the text and says that the text really isn't the ultimate authority for man. It's a nice book of rules. See, those don't come from the outside. I, I posted an article to my Facebook page about a, a Presbyterian USA pastor that got upset when people told him he wasn't a Christian because he denied that there was a God. And I, I, 
I wanted to look and go, I, I had the same look at Paul. I'm bewildered at that statement. I'm amazed. I'm a pastor of a Presbyterian church, but I don't believe that there's a God the Creator. Well, I'm curious, then what do you believe in then as a pastor of a church? And that congregation is being misled and taken down a dark road. We have troublers of the church today. The Jews are doing it in Paul's day. The church has always had troublers in the church since its inception and on until the Lord returns. Why? Because as long as there are churches, there will always be people that cause trouble. And as long as there is a doctrine of salvation by faith alone, there will always be folks that want to grab James and make James say something they doesn't say and put words in his mouth and tell us that it's faith plus works equals salvation. Not just for our salvation. And this is how they'll catch you. Well, not for your salvation, but for the maintenance of your salvation. No. No. Your faith, your works are the evidence of your salvation, but not the maintainer of it. Just like an apple is the evidence that it's an apple tree. But the fruit doesn't make it an apple tree. The tree is an apple tree and the fruit is the evidence of the apple tree. <laughs> but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach the gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. That sounds so polite. As we have said before, and I say now again, if anyone preaches a gospel contrary to the one which you received, let him be accursed. Paul is not stuttering here. Paul didn't stutter while he was writing. Notice the phraseology. If we or an angel of God preach you a message that con conflicts what we've just preached, let him be accursed. This word accursed, it sounds so nice. It's like, let him be blocked on Facebook. Let's just not talk to him at church. Let's just ignore him at the grocery store. That's not what that word means. Paul is actually using extremely harsh terminology here to give to you the understanding of what he means and the seriousness. Let this individual eternally be condemned and damned to hell. That's what he's saying. If anyone preaches a gospel message contrary to that which we've preached, let that individual eternally be condemned and damned to hell. And to reassert that, that he's not playing, he says it again. Paul is not joking. Paul is not playing. Paul does not look at this and go, well, if anyone says this, let them be banned on Facebook. It'll be okay. Jesus loves them anyway. He may very well love them, but he is going to punish them for what they've taught. See, which is why legalism, when we start attaching it to the Bible and faith alone, when we start attaching rules to the faith alone, when we start attaching works to the faith alone, when we start attaching anything to the faith alone, what we are doing is we are running against the word anathema here in the Greek text, which says you are condemned to hell for this. It's a serious business. Not something to be treated lightly. We go, yeah, but I'm doing it for a good reason. Don't care. The road to hell is paved with people with good intentions. They're still going to hell. But I have the best of intentions. I'm trying to pray. No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. When you add to the gospel message, you are perverting the gospel message. Go all the way back to Genesis when Adam changes the rule from you shall not eat to you shall not touch or eat lest you die. See, in that change of the rule right there, humanity falls. See the danger? Paul is emphasizing the danger here and the condemnation for it. Why? And why does he say this? If I was seeking, verse 10, the approval of man 
or God? Am I looking for man's approval? If I was looking for man's approval, I'd be telling you to follow the laws. Why? Because that's what the other individuals are telling you. Notice that this is also in reference back up to chapter 1, verse 1. An apostle not sent from man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. If I was teaching this as the gospel of men, then I would be appointed by them through them. But I'm not doing that. I'm teaching it as someone appointed through Jesus Christ. Why? Because the gospel I preach is not of man's, but I, and for I did not receive it of man, but I was taught it. I received it through Revelation of Jesus Christ. I am speaking this to you authoritatively, not because I was sitting in my tent one day and said, man, this will preach. I wasn't sitting on the side of the road and a tent and go, you know, this faith plus works thing is, is kind of bad. I think I'll make me a new crusade on faith alone. Men in a tent. He got it by the revelation of Jesus Christ directly to him, which is why, as an apostle, he can say, if you hold to this other position or you pervert the gospel message, you're damned to hell eternally. Not me saying this, but Christ and the Father saying this through me. That's why he has the authority to say it. Because it doesn't come through a man's stream. It comes through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now we're going to look later on as Paul begins to tell us how he receives a lot of his training. And you say, that's great. That's great. So what? So what? Why is this so important? So what? When we, the church, allow those that do faith plus works, faith plus whatever, faith plus anything. We cheapen the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We make it cheap because His death is insufficient to fully save. His death lacks something to deliver man. His death is inadequate because our works have to go with it for salvation to occur. You hear how cheaply we have now made the death of Christ? It is by faith alone, the work of Christ alone, to the good pleasure of the Father alone, by the drawing of the Holy Spirit alone, Salvation in Christ alone, by Scripture alone, in faith alone, that we have our salvation. Not through works, not through titles, not through deeds, not through actions, but by faith alone. It's one of the five souls of the Reformation that the Reformers had. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity to come before you. We thank you for the salvific work of the Son alone for our salvation. We ask that you continue to be with us as we focus in on the life we live with you. And it is a life that is and should always put your sacrifice at the forefront of the cost of our sin. Help us continue to focus upon you and the salvific work of the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing upon us and we ask your blessing upon those who are about to follow you in the observance of believers' baptism for your grace and strength to them. We ask for these things in your name we pray. Amen.